transitiates in and about or in and at Hungary or a very tricky title. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yuri, the word is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. So basically the occasion for this uh, talk uh, is the following which I'm going to explain to you in a few minutes but let me share the screen because I have a PowerPoint and that's the best way that everybody can see my PowerPoint. Do, do you see it well? Do you have a full screen? Okay, so uh, basically you can see that Francis Yates in Hungary, which will refer to a concrete uh, historical moment in 1981. And Francis Yates and Hungary, uh, we'll see how much time I left at the end because I would like to point out a couple of uh, uh, trends of research from that time on, basically up to the present in which uh, the influence and inspiration of Francis Yates can be felt and actually some actors, some main characters of this Hungarian research are alumni of CEU, so actually that will connect very directly to the Medieval Studies Department and, and our legacy and our heritage. Uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, show who Frances Yates was, although I think that many of you know who was she, but maybe not everybody. And uh, I would like, first of all, to contextualize her in uh, a little bit of a gender studies or women's studies context, because I think even less of you know who are not particularly in English, uh, English Renaissance studies, so studies about the English Renaissance. What a fantastic female professor generation grew up in the first years of the 20th century, and Francis Yates is one of those. So I'm uh, mentioning uh, a few names on the handout and as I say it's mostly those who are in English studies know these names like Caroline Spurgeon who wrote a very influential book about Shakespeare's imagery and what it tells us, Lily B. Campbell who was an American lady professor and uh, mostly writing about tragedies and, and uh, comedies so basically the genres of, uh, of Renaissance uh, drama writing and playwrights. Una Ellis Fermer, who was very much into image studies and imagery studies. Madeleine Doran is another famous name who wrote a big monograph uh, titled Endeavors of Art. And this is about uh, different genres, how classical genres were revived in the Renaissance and how they influenced uh, Renaissance literature. Helen Gardner was a, a scholar of 17th century mannerist English literature, especially John Donne and and the uh, metaphysical poets and Muriel Bradbrook also can be mentioned in connection with theatricality and did a lot to, to uncover uh, the English Renaissance theatre. So basically it's, it's really a fantastically strong and very influential uh, group of lady professors who were sometimes actually quite fiercely fighting with each other and, and, and uh, getting into uh, the critique of each other and somehow Francis Yates belongs to this generation. <clears throat> However, Francis Yates is the one who broke out from the uh, confines of English Renaissance studies and really she became a very, very internationally famous intellectual historian, uh, joining and belonging to the Warburg School. Now, there is no time to talk about Warburg and the history of the Warburg Institute, how it was founded by Abbe Warburg in Hamburg and then uh, moved uh, after Hitler's takeover to London and as we know presently the Warburg Institute is part of the Institute of Advanced Study belonging to the University of London. Now what are the most important works by her? In her early years you can see on the handout she wrote a book about John Florio who was a an Italian expatriate settled down in England and, sh uh, and he compiled the first Italian English dictionary and that's a very very important kind of contribution to, to linguistics, Renaissance linguistics and, and uh, the, the development of dictionaries. Then Francis Yates wrote a book about the stu a study of Love's Labour's Lost which is one of Shakespeare's play, plays and uh, and continued this kind of research uh, until the 60s when she became really famous with a number of books and I think that in, in this community uh, 
to whom I'm talking now, maybe these books are the most well-known, like uh, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, 64, The Art of Memory, 66, that's very important for medieval scholars, and, and many uh, people say that that was her best book and probably the most long-lasting uh, book in its importance. Then in, in 72 she published The Rosicrucian Enlightenment and in 79 that was her last book, The Occult Philosophy in the Elizabethan Age. In the meantime she published two more books on Shakespeare. One is The Theatre of the World which is a very interesting and provocative and controversial book about the construction of the Globe Theatre and she was trying to find the Vitruvian classical uh, antecedents of the English Renaissance Theatre. And she also published a book about Shakespeare's last plays, uh, the famous uh, romances including The Tempest and several other plays. And she uh, tried to prove that the occult philosophy or hermeticism or whatever we call it had a great influence in these last plays. Now, as probably it's also more or less known, that from the mid-70s there was a growing... F first there was a, a fantastic enthusiasm about her and everybody tried to imitate her and she really put forward such <coughs> very uh, revolutionary propositions uh, in assessing Renaissance culture that there was a general enthusiasm. But then from the mid-70s towards her last years there was also growing criticism uh, mentioning that she made philological mistakes, uh, she propagated fancy grand narratives and of course in post-structuralism grand narrative is a, a swear word and anybody engaged with that was um, in a way criticized. And uh, this uh, period of criticism lasted till the beginning of the 2000s and interestingly we uh, since then, and especially in the past few years, we see a kind of reappraisal of Francis Yates. The time has come to, to tell and to, to reassess in what was she good and forward-looking and inspiring, at the same time not, uh, not trying to hide her mistakes either. So that's the, the general <coughs> background of my talk. And uh, last summer, in the summer of 19, the Warburg Institute organized a conference on Francis Yates' work and legacy uh, and as you can see in the, in the summary of the conference, basically they wanted to explore the academic and intellectual legacy of Dame Francis. She was um, given the title by the British Queen to be a Dame Francis for her uh, scholarly achievements and uh, they try to bring uh, scholars from different areas together who would assess Francis Yates's influence in, in, a, in a very kind of wide-ranging uh, horizon of, of Renaissance studies. So I was also invited to this conference and uh, more or less that was the topic of my, my paper which I read there. Uh, which is the title now that Francis Yates in Hungary and Francis Yates and Hungary, Hungarian Renaissance scholarship in what way was influenced by, <coughs> by her work. Uh, so, to uh, understand this whole thing, why I was invited at all to this conference, we have to go back to 1973 when I was a second year student and uh, in Szeged and very much interested in old Hungarian literature and Renaissance studies and my supervisor Professor Kesheru took me to one of the conferences of the Renaissance Hungarian Renaissance Society which was presided by Professor Tibor Klanicai and, uh, and when I was in introduced to Tibor Klanicai uh, my supervisor said that he is the guy who is interested in the dark side of the Renaissance and then uh, Klanitsai gave me a book, which was the Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition book, and said that, okay, so read this and write a book review about it, because it has not published in Hungarian anything about this book yet. So I read that book and it pretty much put me on a very, very long-lasting track and kind of being under the influence and also struggling with the influence and, and some ideas of uh, Francis Yates. And as a second-year student, I very arrogantly and ignorantly I wrote a letter to her after I figured out her address uh, saying that I'm from a, a poor guy from a socialist country and we don't get to books 
could you send me somewhere or could, me, could you advise me how to get your books? And to my greatest surprise, she answered quite quickly, uh, not mentioning she called me, as you can see, Dr. Sony, which, which was shameful and I was very ashamed because I never claimed that I was a doctor, but that's what she thought. And she sent me a copy of uh, the Giordano Brook, book, which uh, was the first paperback edition published at that time. So you can see this is what I'm having since 1973. And then I continued corresponding with her and in 77 I had a four week uh, little British Council scholarship to go to Britain. So of course uh, my ambition was to visit her at the Warburg Institute and this is what actually happened. And uh, she gave me many off-prints and we had a fantastic talk. She took me to the Warburg Institute and uh, this is when I started writing my MA thesis which uh, interestingly came out as a book. I'm quite proud of that, that an MA thesis published in a, in a book, actually it was 25,000 copies published in Hungary at that time, Secret Sciences and Superstitions, which came out in 1978 after I graduated. And then I sent a copy to Francis Yates, uh, mentioning that this is a book in Hungarian, but that's a, a book which kind of summarizes her achievements. And she answered very kindly, she was delighted with that and very much interested that somebody is dealing with that in Hungary. And uh, in 1980 I went to a conference in Britain when Tibor Klonica told me that why not to invite Francis Yates? You are going to meet with her so take a letter of invitation. And, and he wrote a letter of invitation which I delivered to Francis Yates in London and uh, very uh, to our great delight she answered yes and then the official uh, mechanism started and you can imagine that inviting a western scholar was not a terribly easy thing in the uh, ninth, early 1980s so there was a lot of correspondence first an unofficial letter you can see the heading of uh, Professor Kleinzer's letter to her uh, when they put the things on an official track and uh, basically the invitation was done by the Hungarian Academy and the British Council and uh, she had to fill in a questionnaire for the Academy uh, with her data so on the left side of the screen you can see what she filled in in that Hungarian designed uh, questionnaire what is your first name surname and were you born etc etc and she gave a few uh, very interesting answers that it's not visible on this part that she wrote that I'm Dame Francis Yates so she was kind of emphasizing that and later uh, the question is mar marital status and she wrote spinster and the present position and occupation she wrote writer you know not a scholar or professor or whatever just writer interesting kind of English reactions to that and uh, and this is how everything got on this uh, track of the invitation. Now I don't think I have a time for a full review of this official correspondence which I collected from uh, the archives of the Academy and the, the uh, Literary Institute. There were a lot of comrades involved in this correspondence, uh, various department heads in the Foreign Ministry, at the Academy, at the Ministry of Education and I have this uh, various uh, correspondences to prepare for the visit of Francis Yates. Uh, a special episode was that, that they had to ask a special permission from the minister to give a small number reception for Francis Yates just to meet her for a few Hungarian scholars, not terribly many. When she was coming and finally she arrived. So uh, basically the program actually very nicely grew into a fairly big and, and complex program. On the next slide you can see there is the, the uh, printed official invitation to the Academy lecture. She gave a big talk at the Academy. You can see it was on Wednesday, June 3rd, 1981, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And, and here is uh, an official letter in which they ordered these invitations to be printed. So even that was a fairly long procedure because there had to be an official stamp on on it that it can be printed. Um, where was the lecture? In the Academy of course and here is the picture gallery room Képes Terem in Hungarian in which that lecture was 
with for not a terribly big number of participants but the room was full I remember and everybody was very excited and and enthusiastic about her now this is her draft program which was probably written by Karafiat Judith if not Kleinze himself and uh, they had a small meeting in in the literary institute and they set up a whole week's program it was actually more than a week because she came on on Monday and she left on the following Tuesday so that was a little bit more than a full week and you can see that arrival Hotel Royal then uh, first visit at the Institute of Literary Studies uh, Wednesday was the Academy lecture uh, Thursday was for Seged and I will tell about that to you in a minute and then uh, Friday the English department, Saturday, Sunday was an excursion to Visegrad and Estergom and finally next Monday, Tuesday again at the Institute for various consultations and, and smaller uh, meetings. What is my next slide? That's Seged. So of course I have the most vivid personal memories about that because I had an important role in that but let me read something for you because when I was preparing for this lecture of course I didn't remember all the details it was a long time ago and uh, at that time I worked at the University of Warsaw as a lecturer of Hungarian uh, language and literature and uh, for those two years when I was in Warsaw I wrote a diary normally I'm not a diary writer but I have my diary from those two years and I managed to find what I wrote about that then. So that's what I'm going to read. On Monday, together with Professor Klonice, I was at the airport waiting for her until Friday evening I escorted her to all the programs. On Tuesday she came to the Institute, on Wednesday had her great talk at the Academy, on Thursday we went to Seged by the rector's car. She gave a talk for the English and Old Hungarian Literature Departments and because, as she told, I was the first Hungarian she had met in her life and because I taught in Szeged, she decided to go to Szeged, uh, take the invitation. Now, on the way, she stopped the car because she wanted to see a stork nest at the roadside and that was a very funny episode because she was 80, 82 years old at that time, so certainly not a young lady and when she was flying to Hungary, her secretary wrote to Professor Klonitsoy that we should arrange a wheelchair at the airport because she might be a little frail. And we did that and there was a kind of very careful preparation for her waiting and she kind of jumped out from the plane and waved away the wheelchair and she was in a fantastically good physical strength. So when we drove towards Seged, of course, again, everybody was concerned how she would feel and it was very very hot it was 35 centigrade and all of a sudden she started kind of shouting out on the back seat of the car that stop the car stop the car the driver immediately stopped and she said oh there is a stork nest i've never seen a stork nest in my life so we had to watch the hungarian storks and uh, and then on again my diary uh, it was 35 centigrade plus, everybody was fainting except the old lady who elegantly spoke for 70 minutes in a stuffy room. On top of everything, on the way back to Budapest, she accepted the driver's offer of a non-filtered strong Hungarian cigarette and she smoked it. Which was quite a surprise, although at that time everybody smoked, including myself. On Friday she visited the Budapest English department and gave a wonderfully compassionate account about her intellectual development. In the afternoon I escorted her to the famous Hungarian historian Laszlo Makoi, that was a kind of a private visit. And at this point with regret I had to say goodbye to her since I had to return to Warsaw. And then my friend Tibor Fabini took her over, so actually it was Fabini who escorted her on the weekend excursion to Visegrad and Estergom. Now, uh, let me read one more little quotation from my diary when I kind of summarized my impressions of the visit. She's 82 years old and perhaps the last survival of that great generation of Warburgians who strived for bringing intellectual and art history together. These days she hardly travels anymore, although she still appears vigorous. She decided to come to Hungary, driven by some mission commitment, to build a bridge between historical research 
on the two sides of the iron curtain. And I think that that was very important because really she had this uh, missionary commitment to, to bring Western scholarship to Hungary. And as it turned out, I was not very correct when I wrote in my di diary that she was vigorous. She appeared vigorous and obviously the Hungarian visit very much invigorated her. But as I mentioned, she was 82 years old and in the meantime, I had access to her diary. She, she was a devoted diary writer and practically every day she wrote something about her life. These diaries are now in the Warburg Institute and uh, it turns out from the diary that from January to the visit in June in Hungary, she was in a fairly deep depression. She didn't feel well. She was thinking a lot about death. She had long, long sessions of remembering her brother who was killed in the First World War and more and more she got imbued with, with family history and she was planning to write a family historical uh, journal. And among all these circumstances, when she was not at all well, she was a little bit disturbed and quite depressed. In April, she wrote, yes, in April, she writes in the, in the diary that I'm thinking about Hungary all the time. Okay, so this is absolutely amazing how much she was taken by this invitation and how, how much it, it uh, actually meant to her. And uh, one more thing, after in Hungary she didn't write anything into her diary, she was too much occupied with the programs, but having gone back to England she wrote a couple of more things about Hungary. She was absolutely enthusiastic uh, about the Fi Museum of Fine Arts, for example, and Visegrad, and she wrote in various ways what a fantastic Renaissance culture existed in Hungary and that in the West nobody knew anything about that, at least she didn't know much about that, obviously. And uh, she started, first of all, encouraging Professor Klonica to put together a volume, a kind of uh, collection of essays about the Hungarian Renaissance, and she wanted to help to get it published by Routledge, which was her, her publisher. And uh, I found one more interesting sentence in her diary, when she, after he, she went back uh, to Britain from Hungary. She says, Dear people, wonderful places, we have neglected Central Europe, turned our back on Europe, turned away to America. So that's a very interesting kind of reflection of the, of the British scholar who felt the kind of overwhelming impression of American scholarship on Britain and, and she kind of said that we should have had more contacts and better contacts with, with Eastern Europe. Uh, so that's the first part of the story. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks after her visit in Hungary, she fell in her garden, uh, had a broken hip, and uh, that eventually led to her death in September. That was a very unfortunate situation because, of course, uh, she couldn't recover from that, although at the beginning it seemed that it was not hitting her so much, but then everything turned into the bed and, and she died. So here you can see a letter which I received from uh, Professor Trapp, who was the director of the Warburg Institute at that time, and he clipped the uh, uh, news, oh, sorry, a newspaper clipping that told that she was taken to hospital. And then sometime later, we got the note that she died. Uh, then Professor Koenitsa asked me to write an obituary in uh, in uh, Irodon Tertenti Közlemények, the journal of the Institute, and then Professor Trapp also wrote a kind of thanking letter that they appreciated this, uh, this thing. Uh, but anyway, we didn't give up the idea of a published volume on the Hungarian Renaissance. So we corresponded, mostly Professor Koenitsa corresponded with Routledge and we tried to uh, to put it right, but without Francis Yates it was not possible, there was not enough interest in that, and, and, uh, and uh, Professor Trapp let us know a few months later that Routledge turned it down, that there's no, uh, no real interest for such a volume. So, unfortunately this project, which uh, actually Francis Yates initiated, that uh, there should be a kind of a collection of essays on the Hungarian Renaissance, came to nothing, but uh, since we had a kind of a pool of authors who were uh, interested in and willing to write something about the English Renaissance, uh, the Hungarian Renaissance in English, uh, 
we kept together the company, so to say, and in uh, 1988, with the help of Professor George Ranke, sorry, in 1987, with the help of, the, of Professor George Ranke, we organized a conference on the Hungarian Renaissance in Bloomington, Indiana, where Ranke was the professor of Hungarian studies at that time. Uh, and in the same year, we managed to organize a session for the uh, meeting of the RSA, that is the Renaissance Society of America, which was in Phoenix, Arizona. And there we had another special session on the Hungarian Renaissance and hoped to publish the material in one way or another. Unfortunately, uh, it was not an easy job. The years were passing. Uh, I was entrusted to kind of look after the publication. Uh, came the changing of the system. Everything got reorganized in the country and at the universities. Uh, in the meantime, Professor Ranke died uh, in 1988. And unfortunately, Professor Kleinsay died in 1992. And it was only in 1995 that finally we managed to publish a good selection of essays about the Hungarian Renaissance in the, the International Association of Hungarian Studies called Hungarian Studies. And here on the screen you can see the title page of the journal. Uh, the volume was dedicated to the memory of Professor Klonicai and uh, in the preface I outlined and remembered the initiator Francis Yates who gave the inspiration for doing this research. Well, uh, that's uh, really the end of the first part of my talk and in the second part I would like to talk about the inspiration, what the works of Francis Yates and her presence meant for the development of Hungarian Renaissance scholarship. Uh, it may sound surprising, but actually the first reference to the work of Francis Yates happened in 1967 already, when László Vekerdi, a famous Hungarian uh, historian of science, uh, published a kind of review of science historical studies of the 1960s, and in that he mentioned uh, the works of Yates. You can see on the slides this uh, Tudomány Szervezési Tájékoztató, which was a publication of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, the library, and this is where uh, Vekerdi worked. Uh, then there was a kind of a silence for a few years' time, and as I mentioned, it was really Tibor Klonice who rediscovered or discovered Francis Yates for Hungarian scholarship, and I was one of the persons he kind of entrusted to be uh, a reviewer of Francis Yates, and indeed in the 70s, uh, first still as a student and then as a young lecturer, I wrote several review articles about her work, and of course I also incorporated her achievements and her suggestions into my own research work. Uh, if we kind of Google on the name of Francis Yates in Hungarian uh, repertories, for example the Arcanum, database, we can see that uh, the most popular work by her is the art of memory. It's even referred to today's, and not only by Renaissance scholars, but uh, it features very prominently, for example, in memory studies, which are very fashionable these days. Uh, second runner is the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, and the third place goes to the Giordano Bruno book. So somehow her other works, uh, uh, including the works on Shakespeare, have not been so much used, but Hungarian Shakespeare scholars also uh, made several references to that. Uh, but the most important influence I would like to summarize is the, that kind of uh, suggestion and insight that not everything which previously in the 19th century or in the early 20th century was considered to be dark side, uh, murky, uh, problematic aspects of the Renaissance to be ashamed of. Uh, after Francis Yates's uh, very bold propositions became in the focus of interest and it turned out that those murky sides of the Renaissance also contributed to further developments and have very, very important uh, echoes even in today, in, in the 21st, uh, 20th and the 21st century. Uh, so, without 
the propositions of Yeats, certain Hungarian achievements of the Renaissance would not have been the same as they became uh, with that encouragement which came from the propositions of Yeats. Uh, I would like to mention three persons, three very interesting Hungarian or Hungarian-related Hungary intellectuals whose um, assessment and who, whose work was very much connected to esotericism, to the occult sciences, and uh, the emphasis on these esoteric aspects actually, as I mentioned uh, and suggest, came from the inspiration of uh, the work of Francis Yates. Hans Derschwan is the first character. He was uh, the uh, agent of the Fugger banking house in Hungary, stationed in Upper Hungary, and he collected an amazingly large private library, which consisted of about 4,000 volumes. Uh, John Dee, who was one of the leading intellectuals and bibliophiles of, of contemporary Europe, also had about 4,000 books in his library. So I think it's, it's uh, very important to know that there was such a private library in Hungary. In brackets I mentioned that there was an even larger private uh, library, uh, that of uh, Johannes Sambukus or Zsambuki, the Hungarian emblem writer and bibliophile. Uh, most of the book stock actually was collected abroad and then transported to Vienna to the Imperial Library. But uh, Dan Schwamm had his uh, collection, his library in the territory of Hungary. Now, uh, in the late 70s and throughout the 80s and the 90s, a very important project was going on in Hungary, initiated in Szeged and mostly done by scholars resident in Szeged, led by uh, Balint Keserű and, and István Monok. And the purpose of this project was to collect all references to early modern books in Hungary and their owners and to publish the book lists, the inventories of libraries and reconstruct the libraries of whatever kind of intellectuals uh, in the territory of historical Hungary. So, if we examine the book list, the book collection of Wernstrom, we see that about 19% of the books fell into the category of magica and uh, various occult sciences. The next name is Andras Dudic, <coughs> who was a Hungarian magnate of Italian and Croatian origin, became a Catholic priest, eventually became uh, the Bishop of Page, then he converted to Protestantism and moved over to Krakow and became a leading intellectual there. And when the Catholic uh, Stephen Bathory or Istvan Bathory was elected as Polish king, he emigrated to uh, Breslau, that is Wroclaw today, and there he lived until his death as a major uh, bibliophile, intellectual, had a huge correspondence with various intellectuals of his, of his age. He also had a huge library and he was so much interested in the occult sciences that when John Dee uh, the famous Elizabethan mathematician and magus arrived in uh, Prague to trying to get a position uh, from Rudolf II. Dudic wrote his friend uh, Tadeusz Hayek, an astronomer stationed in Prague, whether he could uh, ask John Dee to suggest somebody to be his uh, kind of home mathematician and uh, maybe astrologer, astrologer as well. The third name is Batyan, ba uh, Boldizsár Batyányi, a Hungarian magnate who had a very, very interesting life in his youth. He was serving as a page in the uh, French court of uh, Henry II and, and Mary Stuart. And then he traveled all around Europe, finally came home, became a leading Hungarian aristocrat. And in his home castle in Németújvár, which is today in Austria and called Güssing, there he collected a fairly sizable library uh, featuring a lot of occult books and esoteric books. And he also built an alchemical laboratory and he had a circle of humanists and fellow aristocrats about him to uh, share this interest of the occult sciences. Now again, it was a kind of offshoot uh, or offspring of Francis Yates' influence that 
Hungarian scholars started focusing on this occult interest, and uh, one of CEU's alumni, or alumna, uh, Dora Bobori, wrote a monograph about him. Uh, previously, the Seged group published the uh, various uh, documents relating to Botyani's library, book lists, and, and uh, uh, bills which were, which were sent by Western booksellers and shows what kind of books he was buying. So there was that publication and came the monograph of Dora Bobori in English, so now it's internationally known. And uh, most recently, she also published the correspondence of Batyani. Uh, so these were three examples which show that uh, characters, uh, persons of intellectual life, uh, representatives we might call of intellectual curiosity, early modern intellectual curiosity, got into the limelight because of their occult in interests and uh, after that science historical and intellectual historical turning point in which Francis Yates was a key figure, their assessment and the direction of their research uh, definitely changed and took a new direction. Uh, unfortunately, to explain this slide would need a full-length lecture, so I'm just very, very briefly and in a sketchy way, I mention that these characters who are on this table seem to uh, constitute an esoterically-minded Central European network, which had very vital connections to Western Europe as well, but among each other as well. And uh, the, the full appreciation of the intellectual activities of this circle actually, again, can be connected to uh, Francis Yates in the background. Now, of course, the most important umbrella figure of the, of the network is Rudolf II, the esoterically or occult-minded emperor who collected all sorts of weird characters uh, around him. Uh, dabbling in various sciences and less accepted, or today somebody might say pseudosciences, but certainly medicine, uh, astronomy, astrology, uh, magic, all these things were very strongly connected in the early modern period. And Rudolf was a, a patron uh, and a, a kind of an encouraging center of these intellectuals to come together. Now we see a couple of magnates, very important aristocrats, Central European aristocrats. Odjar Batyany was already mentioned, who also had important court positions under Rudolf II. Uh, someone could mention uh, Albrecht or Albert Lasky, who was a Polish prince, very similarly kind of magically minded and uh, sometimes he was also called the kingmaker. He visited England. He wanted uh, his candidates for the Polish throne and all sorts of uh, interesting uh, political and intellectual networks. He was kind of pulling the strings in these networks. And the third important character is uh, Wilhelm Rosenberg, who was a Czech magnate, again with his interests and intellectual uh, habitus uh, quite close and similar to Lasky and Batyany. Now we also see an English aristocrat on the, on the slide, Philip Sidney, who was a student of John Dee, and while John Dee visited here in the 1560s first, then Philip Sidney came in the 1570s, had all sorts of connections, Central European connections, including Hungarian connections, and then John Dee again came to Central Europe in the 1580s. So basically we are spanning a 25-year long period in which uh, magically minded intellectuals, but also politically active uh, aristocrats and diplomats were kind of crisscrossing uh, between, between the Habsburg Empire and various Western European countries. Andreas Dudic is also on the, on the table, and uh, Tadeusz ha ha Hayek, or Hagetius, the Czech astronomer, whom I mentioned already. And uh, there's one more interesting little picture, the Vehel Presses, the coat of arms or the emblem of the Vehel Presses. The Vehels were originally a, a, a Huguenot family uh, who came from 
uh, France and then they settled down in Germany and became very, very important printers and many of their books were bought by Central European intellectuals. Um, Batyani actually bought a great number of Wehel books uh, while or via the help of a bookseller called Jean Aubry. Jean Aubry also came from France and uh, because of his Protestant religion he settled down in Germany and became a close associate of Baudigar Batyani and supplying him with all sorts of interesting books. So we, we have you know this very complex and very interesting intellectual network which uh, again the, the research of which uh, took a very significant turn after the influence of Francis Yates from the 70s and one more person has to be mentioned who had an absolutely key role in transmitting the Yatesian interests into Central European including Hungarian scholarship and that was Robert W. Uh, J. W. Evans. Now Evans became famous with his first big monograph, Rudolf II and his World, which was an intellectual biography published in 1973. And uh, in that book he definitely tried to apply uh, Yeatsian visions and propositions combined with an extremely meticulous archival and library research, also equipped with a great number of Central European languages. Evans. Uh, speaks perfect Hungarian, knows very good Polish and Czech and uh, he took the trouble of actually coming here to Central Europe doing the research and uh, as a result uh, the book became very famous and much appreciated. Later on he wrote a second monograph which was about the making of the Habsburg monarchy uh, covering really the 17th century, mostly the 17th century and um, <coughs> he kind of turned away from the, the Yeatsian influences uh, and uh, shows a kind of disenchantment with that enthusiasm about esotericism in the 17th century. Uh, I have personally some mild criticism against his new approach which he uh, demonstrated in this new book, in the second book, but I don't want to go into the details of that. I've written a paper about that in which I detail my arguments and counter arguments but this doesn't change the fact that without Robert Evans again uh, Central European scholarship focusing in these territories in these areas of intellectual history would uh, be completely different. Uh, time is running out so I will quickly finish this very sketchy uh, inventory of some Central European uh, fruits of Francis Yates' proposition and I would like to jump into the 18th century to a Hungarian Jesuit who was called Janusz Molnár, a very important intellectual and a very interesting and very admirable person at the same time. Uh, as a Jesuit he was obviously under a very strong influence of Athanasius Kircher who was one of the towering figures, towering scholars of, of Jesuit scholarship uh, in the 17th century. And uh, under this influence, Janusz Molnár wrote and published of notable ancient buildings or monuments in 1760. And uh, this is the first kind of architectural history written in Hungarian. In this respect, it's a very important book and it's beautifully illustrated. If uh, somebody scrutinizes the text of this book, we'll see that actually the book, the first chapter of the book is a summary and an elaboration on the Corpus Hermeticum, the tracts attributed to Hermes Trismegistus from the Hellenistic period. And uh, someone could say that it's uh, very anachronistic and almost nonsensical that the Jesuit writes about this in 70, uh, 1760, but uh, at least it's very interesting from the viewpoint that this is the first extensive treatment and kind of speculation about the influence of Hermeticism on human intellectual development. So even if it's outdated a bit, it's a very valuable and still interesting uh, cultural historical, intellectual historical monument. But how interesting the whole story is that only 17 years later, in 1777, Janusz Molnár publishes another book, also in Hungarian, and the book is the summary 
of the uh, astronomical and physical achievements of Isaac Newton. Uh, the, the Hungarian title says that about nature as taught by Newton and his disciples. So basically it's a Newtonistic book and again I have to emphasize that this is really the first Hungarian language summary of Newton's physics which is not only important and interesting from the science historical viewpoint but also from the linguistic viewpoint because with this book uh, Janusz Molnar created the kind of scientific language, physical term, language terminology, which was needed to uh, to talk about Newton at all. Well, that uh, was a couple of examples to to uh, kind of prove how important, directly or indirectly, Francis Yates was for Hungarian and Central European scholarship. Of course, I have to admit that me personally had a very strong influence uh, by her and in many of my later writings I always combined the appreciation of her together with some sort of criticism uh, because obviously not everything was perfect uh, uh, what she suggested and she certainly made some mistakes and we clearly see these mistakes now but uh, without the propositions and without the inspirations not only the mistakes would not be known, but this whole huge area of intellectual history would be a much less uh, observed and discussed area. Well, I think that was what I mostly wanted to say for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to get some feedback in the discussion. Uh, ...in the diary that how much she was impressed by the visit in Visegrad mm -hmm. and how much it has changed her perception of uh, of the Renaissance in Central Europe. Now I would say that that's strange in a way because when uh, maybe Yuri, you can go back to that slide mm -hmm. and that slide was showing two different things. Of course, yes. One of them was the the chapel the true Renaissance chapel in the Estergum Cathedral, which is, it's a standing, although we know that it has been taken into pieces and reassembled and so on, but if you enter, that's a genuine red marble Renaissance chapel, certainly a masterpiece of Renaissance architecture. Uh, so these are the two pictures below. That's Estergo, yeah. that's right. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing which looked like more or less the same, uh -huh. I think, in 1981. Yes. But if you think about the upper two pictures, which is Visegrad, and how mm -hmm. did it look like in uh, uh, 1981, it looked like totally different because of the most recent restoration project. Uh, it did not look like that much uh -huh. of, uh, of a renaissance or whatever gothic palace with important renaissance details. In fact, this was how did it look like. So it did not look like that uh -huh. today. Uh -huh. You can see that the only renaissance real element in that site, in that moment was the three red marble slabs of the Hercules fountain, which uh -huh. you can see in the middle uh -huh. of this image. So it is much, much less than it is today. And I think that makes the whole story even more interesting because uh, in this case, uh, in this case, it was not that, how can I say, impressive. And it still catch the catch the eyes of her, and and was so important for her. So this is what I find very interesting: mm -hmm. that it was certainly something totally new. That oh, such things can appear in that places, and uh, you use some biographical details. I have to mention that was at least I have to remember which year, but at least two decades later, or even more than two decades later, I had a lecture in Princeton in the Institute of Archaeology and Art History, 
And I was talking about this reconstruction project. And when I did show these slides, the reaction was like, wow, I mean, there are such things in Hungary, it's amazing. So even in a place like that, these things were not necessarily known. Second is more on a, on a kind of uh, small detail, but I found it interesting. I mean, you refer to many places, partly to personal contacts in the 16th or in the 17th century. And you also refer to personal contacts, of course, in the beginning of your story or how later students um, played a role in the studies, students of this department played a role in the studies in the relevant field, for example, on the Botany, on Bordesar Botany and things like that. And you did show uh, one important person in this story who was Robert Evans. And it's also interesting that Robert Evans is not only a scholar of that field who really uh, wrote these groundbreaking uh, new interpretations of the period, but it, it, he played an absolutely crucial role in the, in the story of this department as well, because three members, unfortunately one of them is not anymore with us, three members of this department were able to in a way, study with the help of Robert Evans in Oxford in the 1980s, which was almost impossible. And we know exactly that his personal role, and even more the role of his wife, who was working in the Bodleian Library and worked there for decades and helped everybody from Central Europe to carry out studies there, how influential they were that people got scholarship and they were able to study there. And on top, he also, because of that, after the department has been created, he was serving for many years on the advisory board of the department. So just to see these international personal contacts, which were related to many different things, are still playing a similar role. This is what I find fascinating about how in the Renaissance this correspondence between people, sometimes a visit, can change a whole field. And I believe this is also true for the last decades of the 20th century. So this one visit was so important in the early 1980s, mm -hmm. but there were follow-ups and they are still influencing our life in many ways. Thank you very much. If I if I can react to that immediately, because then I will forget. Uh, as for this last point, I fully agree with that, and certainly uh, Bob Evans was and has been very influential for many of us. So there's no question about that. But what you raised first, this photograph, is a fascinating thing, and I am going to reveal a kind of a secret now. When I compiled this uh, lecture and I compiled the PowerPoint, which of course was made for the Warburg Institute and for the international audience there, I was thinking which pictures to put about Visegrad. And I was facing exactly that, that problem, what you, what you mentioned. And I was afraid that in 2019, if I showed that picture and then started explaining that, yes, at that time it was just a ruin, but since then what happened then? that lecture wouldn't have allowed you know such an explanation and contextualization so i decided to put in the new pictures which obviously francis yes didn't see uh, just to impress my international audience more in london in 2019 but of course i know that francis yes just saw the original one but she mentions the following in her diary not going into details but what she was delighted with she mentions the uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest and the Renaissance red marble fountain of King Matthias. So this is how it's in the in the diary. So even those three slabs obviously uh, influenced and impressed her very much. And uh, one more thing to what Gabor said about the context of this visit. And uh, and again, this is a, a good kind of case study how how the politics of of socialist. Uh, uh, organizations and and uh, and scholarly life was going on that uh, after the second visit on Friday as I mentioned she went to the English department of the uh, Alta University and I talked to Peter David who was present there and uh, and what she remembers uh, 
and what uh, he what he remembers and that's the following that uh, Francis Yates came to give a talk for them at the English department with the title the occult philosophy of the English Renaissance that was her last book but then the leadership of the department was very worried that giving a talk on the occult Renaissance it, it's something dangerous or problematic and they managed to fish an American scholar who was infinitely less famous than Francis Yates and putting them together in the same uh, workshop series and and uh, the, the then head of the department introduced that we have two world famous scholars Francis Yates talking about this and this American scholar talking about that so basically she didn't get a, an individual slot but was combined with another lecture I, I can uh, have another comment on I think that's very interesting uh, what you said about the uh, lady uh, scholars in Britain mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one more uh, comes to my mind the Egyptologist Margaret Murray yes who, yes. who was uh, also uh, somebody an Egyptologist who turned uh, 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 an expert of witchcraft uh, and mm -hmm. uh, she became a real cult figure uh, uh, in the 1920s uh, uh, her uh, observation she was an anthropologist Egyptologist anthropologist and uh, uh, at that time uh, uh, there was a research and a debate on the fact whether uh, uh, witches uh, uh, really uh, uh, had whether there existed uh, such a, a kind of uh, uh, magic practicing uh, female uh, group uh, that the witches were supposed to be uh, uh, who met secretly by night on a witch's sabbath and uh, had uh, some kind of orgiastic uh, customs and venerated uh, horn uh, god, the devil. So, uh, of course, uh, this was uh, held by the positivist scholars as a kind of uh, invention uh, of the inquisitors and uh, a kind of uh, uh, nightmarish mythology uh, of which nothing was true. It had a great influence uh, in uh, on the research and also on the fantasies of uh, uh, modern uh, uh, interested people in witches and uh, that was also illustrating a little bit that type of fascination for the occult in the 1930s, 40s in Britain the uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, surroundings from where also Francis Yates came and uh, Margaret Murray was later on also still uh, until the 1960s uh, uh, venerated as a kind of uh, cult figure uh, uh, not only by these Wiccas but also uh, a, a kind of uh, a group of scholarly life but also put down by others uh, because uh, her mistake was that uh, of course, she took for granted, uh, uh, granted what the witches on the torture chamber, in the torture chamber, uh, confessed according to the inquisitorial handbooks, and uh, she exercised uh, uh, no historical criticism of the situation and the documents themselves. Uh, she just took them as a kind of authentic anthropological description. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to return to one of the um, comments. I about the importance of networks. Um, because in some ways, um, it's also I think, a very interesting point of what we've heard um, in the lecture is, is the way how, uh, both in the past, but still to some extent, Central Europe becomes registered uh, academically um, in, in, in the West, so to say, and uh, in this particular case in Britain. That it's so much, even now, I would say, even if it's so much more translated, it seems to still rely on on um, personal connection and sometimes sort of strange discovery as she had this um, this moment in, in check that oh, what an amazing renaissance there was there. And I think that often there's no contact of seeing objects or buildings suddenly um, makes realize that the phenomenon X also existed in Central Europe. And then what of course happens, um, it starts uh, to filter these examples or um, or wide observation about different kinds of phenomena across, um, well, in my case, I can talk about the latest. How can we then appear um, 
um, sometimes it's um, kind of marginal, sometimes more prominent, sometimes it's a comparison in Western scholarship. Um, so I think we, we I think this, this role, um, even despite there's so much more translated, so in some ways this knowledge from East Central is much more systematically available. I think still this, this personal um, points, um, the moment when somebody discovers, sees, um, something that they are totally unaware of uh, still plays a role. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, I, I would only add to that that uh, if we think of uh, early modern studies or Renaissance studies, of course, a number of skills are necessary for that. So first of all, you have to know some of these languages. You have to be familiar with the archives. And uh, I'm sorry to say that British scholars have not really excelled in, in these fields, no. uh, as opposed to Italians or some Germans. And uh, Robert Evans is really a great, great, great uh, exception in this respect, partly because he has a Hungarian wife, obviously that also influenced him. But he learned a very good Hungarian, he also knows Polish and all the classical languages. So, I mean, for him, language-wise was very easy to move around here and his archival skills are also fantastic. I mean, if you look at his books and the apparatus and the footnote, you can see that he went to the archives, he went to the rare book libra libraries and everywhere. I, for, for one more comment, i like to come back what Emilia said, that I found it uh, very interesting, this aspect, this kind of finding out about Central Europe certain things and like in the story what Yuri was presenting for us, personal visits are absolutely crucial mm -hmm. because it's a totally different thing if you learn about it or read, read articles but if it's presented for you by some, uh, you are a guest and it's presented for you and you are confronted to that one, that makes a big difference. And I felt this when we were talking about the circumstances of this visit, that I had a number of experiences, very similar experiences, when I really had the privilege to have some very big scholars to guide at the exact place at Visegrad. And what was the reaction there? And I also know what was the reaction or what was the effect of that visit later, because I heard back from other people, what they were telling or writing about this after the visit. One of them is, in the story, very relevant person, Peter Burke. So when he had the lecture series at CEU, it was on his list that we should go there. And after the visit, I know that it made an impact how he has written his book, which is about the lecture series at CEU. Oana, yes, yeah, she also asked about the dark side of the Renaissance. Well, dark side of the Renaissance, of course, this is not a particularly uh, politically correct term today, and I don't think that any anybody since 2000 would uh, speak about that. But there was a time in the, uh, in the uh, 70s, 80s, or maybe even reaching back to the 60s, and in Renaissance uh, studies as well as in Enlightenment studies, there was a, a, a kind of a, a shift of um, preconceptions, I would say, very similar to the thesis of Francis Yates, namely that not only that is valuable and praiseworthy, which is rationalistic and which is uh, based on a kind of idea of evolution, so that was a big discovery to, 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 to realize that the Enlightenment was not at all, all the time, bright and rationalistic, but there, was, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, kind of occult, esoteric, whatever, uh, trends within the, uh, within the Enlightenment. And the same thing happened over the Renaissance, that especially Marxist scholarship liked to see that Renaissance was the threshold or the antechamber towards Enlightenment, and then finally the the socialist development and they emphasize the revolutionary character of the reformation for example and and things like that and then uh, Hiram Haydn an American scholar wrote in the 60s a book called the counter renaissance and that was uh, such an effort to to show that uh, not not everything about the renaissance is just as we imagine it to be but it was much more complex and contradictory uh, 
So, so in the 70s, you know, when Tibor Klonse gave me Francis Yates's book, he was partly joking to say that here is a book about the dark side of the Renaissance because this is about magic in the Renaissance, you know. I don't know if it, if it satisfies you, Oana, but that would be my answer. Yes, it's interesting. Thank you for this. It's actually interesting because the same phrasing has a totally different meaning in very different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Just a word uh, to add. Uh, so, as for enlightenment, it's Robert Darnton who uh, has mm -hmm. a book on uh, this dark side of yeah. the enlightenment. Uh, that means also, for example, uh, all the uh, uh, underworld of intellectual life, the uh, the pornographic pamphlets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was the age of Marquis de Sade, also, but uh, uh, many other things, and uh, all the. Uh, uh, mass-produced uh, low-level intellectual products. Uh, that's very interesting. That goes together with, uh, with the bright side of uh, enlightenment. That was also an age when uh, all kinds of uh, uh, occultist and magical speculations were there as well. But uh, actually what Yeats was writing about was uh, uh, a little bit different and that's, that's what was interesting in, uh, in her and also in uh, way of presenting it because uh, this led to a reinterpretation of what we thought about magic and the role of magic in, uh, uh, in general uh, in the uh, evolution of uh, human uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, approach to nature and to the force of forces of nature and also to the human soul and many other Thing. So that that was that led really uh, to a reinterpretation, and in that sense, that book of Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic uh, uh, tradition that was really uh, one of the key uh, books to change people's uh, uh, outlook on all that. We should we should somehow uh, prepare our drinks, and that maybe <laughs> uh, then uh, uh, lecture could be followed by. Uh, much more, uh, yeah. Some some of you have. That's that's a good idea. But maybe uh, uh, wine uh, should be served uh, by everybody at home, and then uh, it would cheer us up. In any case.